Good evening and welcome everyone to tonight's meeting. The gig economy is coming for you. How the Ford government and Uber plan to gigify the economy. My name is James Clark. I use he, him pronouns and I'm the interim director of research and education at the Ontario Federation of Labor. I'll begin tonight's meeting by starting with a land acknowledgement. We're gathering here today from communities all across Ontario. I'm facilitating from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. This area is governed by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant. The Dish with One Spoon is sometimes called the bowl or kettle and represents what is now Southern Ontario. We all eat out of this dish and share this territory with only one spoon. In honoring our ability to gather, we recognize the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples who have inhabited and cared for this land for many millennia. Wherever you live on Turtle Island, we are all treaty people who give gratitude to indigenous peoples for their wisdom and strength and how we look after each other and the land. Part of each of our reconciliation efforts compels us to know and understand our colonialist history, the devastating destruction it has caused and the ways it continues to damage the lives of many. During this COVID-19 pandemic, we witness an even clearer view of the disparities in our shared space and work, diligently every day to ensure the prosperity of all peoples. As labor leaders and activists in our respective communities who are advocating for workers' rights, we must take particular care to ensure we are advocating for the rights, health, and safety of Indigenous communities. So before I hand it over to our first speaker, I just wanna review a couple of housekeeping items. The first is to let you know how tonight's meeting is gonna work. There'll be plenty of time for a discussion, for a question and answer after each of the speakers have a chance to make their introductory rem remarks. We have an amazing lineup of speakers tonight. If you have any questions or comments, we're gonna encourage you to itemize those in the chat or to ask a question in the Q&A box that will be available for all participants. So again, if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to participate in the chat. And if you have a question for the speakers, you can ask it in the Q&A box. And now I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker who is gonna make some introductory remarks before we get into the main session of the meeting. Our first speaker tonight is Patty Coates. Patty is the president of the Ontario Federation of Labor. I'm happy to introduce Patty to you. Over to you, Patty. Thank you, James. And good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here for this very important conversation. And thank you to everyone who collaborated on this event. As James said, my name is Patty Coates. I use she and her pronouns, and I am the president of the Ontario Federation of Labor. Right now, Doug Ford's conservative government is contemplating carve outs of the Employment Standards Act that would entrench precarious conditions for the most vulnerable workers. These carve outs come from recommendations released last month by Doug Ford's hand-picked Ontario Workforce Recovery Advisory Committee. Their report on the future of work opens the door to the gigification of the entire economy and proposes creating a new subcategory that will leave gig workers without full and equal rights. As we've said over and over, gig workers are workers full stop. They deserve nothing less than the full and equal rights and protections afforded to all workers under the Employment Standards Act. That means no carve outs, payment for all hours of work, compensation for work related expenses, full and equal access to existing benefits and programs, data transparency, counting gig work towards permanent residency applications, recognizing gig workers' right to form a union and an end to arbitrary deactivations. We know that gig workers have been fighting back to demand the rights that they all deserve. Now is the time to ensure that the whole labor movement is united in this fight. That's what we're here to do tonight. We have a lineup of incredible speakers to talk about how we build this fight back. You'll hear stories from a similar fight that happened in California, 
firsthand worker experiences and learn, learn more about the future of work consultation process and the impl impl implications of their recommendations. We cannot let Ford's conservative government make it easier for employers to misclassify workers as independent contractors and exclude them from Ontario's minimum labor standards. And we won't, because all of our jobs are at risk unless we stand up for decent work for every single one of us. Now, I will hand it over to Jennifer Scott, president of Gig Workers United to kick off tonight's discussion. Jennifer, over to you. Hi. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. It, it is it's very reassuring to see so many people here in this room with us. Um, like Patty said, so I'm a gig worker. So uh, I live and work in Toronto. I work um, on apps like Uber and DoorDash and Skip the Dishes. And I, I work on bicycles. So delivering mostly like hot on demand food. Um, as a member of Gig Workers United, uh, you know, our union is about uniting together gig workers, no matter the app that we work on, whether it's food delivery, um, whether it's grocery delivery, whether it's mail delivery, you know, something like Amazon Flex or Instacart, no matter the apps that we work on or the types of vehicles that we use or the cities that we deliver in, we are all facing the same problem, which is misclassification and, you know, terribly regressive labor policy. Um, and for us, you know, when we when we created Gig Workers United and we thought about what do we need to have good work, we wanted to build a union where no matter the app, no matter our situation, we could be united together with all of us because we all need the same change to have good working conditions. Um, so Patty talked to you about the Gig Workers Bill of Rights, which is our demand. Our demand is full workers' rights for gig workers. Working through the pandemic, we were essential workers. Our work is valuable, our work is necessary, and correct classification is necessary for us to continue working in a healthy, high-quality way. Um, what we're here to talk about today, obviously, is, is not good news. We're not talking about something fun. The government is talking about carve-outs and proposed legislation for carve-outs. And that won't just impact gig workers, that will impact everybody in Ontario who works. This is a hard fight. It's a big fight. It's a little bit intimidating. But at the same time, like when I think about gig workers, I don't, I can't, I can't think about, I can't think of anyone who knows more than we do what it means to put up a hard fight when you're facing one. People thought that it was impossible for us to organize. We don't have a workplace. We don't have a lunchroom. We, you know, our, our workplace is the world, the city. And for us, organizing means being out on the street, flagging each other down, having organizing conversations in the rain, in the snow, in, in really hot conditions. But we do it. We do it because we need to and because we want to, and we recognize that we deserve full workers' rights. Um, and so when I think about all of us coming here together today, I feel like that's just, you know, it's just a magnified version of that. Instead of uniting gig workers, we're just gonna unite everybody in the province who works, no matter the sector, no matter their job, no matter their union. And to me, I mean, like, I, I don't know about you, that sounds like a dream, like, yes, let's do that. Um, you know, now is the time we're facing legislation, we're facing legislation that will impact all of us. And we have this opportunity to unite workers all over the province together to fight back. Um, and I think about like coming out of the pandemic, you know, we see people who came out of the pandemic and it wasn't that hard for them, they're okay. And a lot of us aren't okay. A lot of us watched people who have power and money make decisions not to support us, not to keep us safe. And that's, I don't know about you, that makes me feel terrible, like, and so, so angry, which is like a just anger, but it's a very intense anger. Um, you know, and then today we're united in this moment, while the Omicron variant is still very intense, while work is still very unsafe, we're united to talk about 
legislation that would create a future of work where we have less than we have now. The whole thing is very offensive. Um, and, and so like in that, I find hope in us being here and us uniting together, in us putting up a fight, working together. It'll be hard work, that's true. But if we do it together, it's never really that hard, is it? Okay. Um, Joshua Mandrake is our first panelist. Um, Josh, uh, who's Josh? Josh is a labor lawyer, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and he works at Goldblatt and is counsel to the OFL. Um, and uh, yeah, Josh, uh, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Jennifer? Good, thank you. Uh, can you tell us what the future of work consultations were and what they've proposed for gig workers in the gig economy in Ontario? Absolutely. First off, so nice to be here with friends to talk about this important fight ahead for a fair future for gig workers. I'm, I'm always inspired by, by hearing you talk about the fights that you've had and, and the fights ahead. So uh, about this, uh, this consultation process. Uh, so the Ford government struck up what it called the Ontario Workforce Recovery Advisory Committee. And this was struck to make recommendations with respect to the future of work. Now, the committee was given a really broad mandate that went way beyond gig workers alone, but I think that most observers saw this as really uh, about teeing up um, uh, changes uh, with respect to gig work in response to Uber's lobbying and PR efforts in Canada. And so the committee issued its report in November, but before I speak about the report itself, I want to speak about uh, the process that got us there. This was not a meaningful consultation process. Uh, instead, it was a flawed exercise from the get-go, and it was structured in a way that all but guaranteed minimal worker participation. These uh, flaws, these deep flaws in the process were extensively cataloged in the OFL submissions. Uh, I'd encourage all of you to read those submissions. There's a link in the chat. But briefly to summarize, some of the key problems included a lack of worker voice or participation, a rushed timeline for the submissions, no clear guidance for, for what the written submissions were looking for other than big overarching questions. There were no public consultations, i.e. Uh, ways to actually get working people there to speak to them. There were some limited invite only consultations with stakeholders. These were uh, fairly last minute. They were also facilitated by a polling firm. And that just reinforced the notion that this whole thing was just a public relations exercise to get to a predetermined outcome. Uh, as an aside, I would note that the PR firm that was hired and that ran these just happened to be the same firm that was also hired by Uber to do its, its efforts in Canada. Uh, the timing of the committee was suspect, falling shortly after Uber launched its public and PR campaign for its so-called Flexible Work Plus. And the whole process left people with the feeling that the fix was in, so to speak, uh, and that this committee was path-bound to making recommendations to try and set workers back. And that leads us to the report that came out in November. Uh, which is more or less uh, exactly what the, the type of outcome that critics expected. Um, there are a number of very concerning uh, proposals in here, uh, one of which that I won't get into any detail in for, for non-gig workers, uh, calls to make it easier to classify people as independent contractors. It's a very concerning proposal. But in terms of gig workers specifically, the central recommendation is a proposal to create a third dependent contractor category for gig or platform workers in the app-based space. Uh, and it calls to give them some uh, quote unquote minimum or core benefits. And it's pretty clear from reading the report and the recommendation that this is not calling for full and equal status for gig workers. Uh, and one of the most dangerous things about this proposal is that it's being framed as a positive step. It's being framed uh, as something to help gig workers or give them more rights. And in that sense, and, and Vina can speak to this far better than I could, it's, it's sort of out of the Prop 22 playbook in that regard. Um, if you listen to the announcement about this proposal, you'd be given the impression that this was somehow a win for gig workers, but that's not the case. Gig workers are misclassified employees. They deserve full and equal rights. But instead of guaranteeing them the rights that they're currently being wrongly denied by their employers, this proposal would instead lock them into a second tier status with less rights. And I think part of the confusion uh, that this is allowing to create uh, has been by the careful use of the term dependent contractor. 
uh, in, in this recommendation. And so dependent contractor is a term that we have some experience with in Canada. Uh, it's a category that exists at common law. It's also a category that's used in the labor relations context that many of the folks here from a union background might be familiar with it. Uh, in Ontario, uh, employee is defined under the Labor Relations Act to include dependent contractor. And so what that means is, is dependent contractors under the Labor Relations Act have all of the same rights as employees for labor relations purpose. And that's a good thing. But what this committee is proposing is not uh, to amend the Employment Standards Act uh, to clarify that uh, employees include dependent contractors. That would have put it in line with the Labor Relations Act, and that would have followed a recommendation from a previous review from years back. Instead, what it's calling for is a third uh, intermediate category, uh, a category that would be specific for gig workers in the app-based space not for all workers, and it would appear to provide them less than full and equal prevention, uh, protections. And so this is just the wrong approach. It's totally wrong-headed. And what's sort of animating this are all of these assumptions about gig work that are just completely faulty. And so one is there's this assumption that there's somehow a tension between employment status and flexibility. There's this assumption kicked into all of this that uh, the current treatment of gig workers is due to some genuine legal ambiguity, and it's not about the ruthless exploitation that these Silicon Valley-based companies uh, are, are doing for their workers right now. And, and, and it's also motivating this, this specific carve out for app-based gig workers. Part of what's motivating this is this idea that it's, a, it's somehow a gig or a platform specific issue that needs a gig or a platform specific response, when really this is part of a broader issue of misclassification that hurts all workers. Uh, and uh, so that's what the proposal is, but the report is also remarkable for what it's missing when it comes to gig workers. And you and Patty both spoke about the Gig Workers Bill of Rights, and now uh, gig workers and their allies have been clear about the things that, that you want and that you need and that you deserve to be treated fairly. And so, for instance, one of those key points uh, is, is to be paid for all hours of work and not just for the so-called engage time from when you accept an order to when you drop it off. This is in the Gig Workers Bill of Rights. This is something that, uh, that gig workers and their allies are fighting for and that made this clear in front of the committee. And uh, this is a fundamental fight in the gig economy. And, uh, and it has huge implications for workers. And it's remarkable because this is entirely absent from the report. They don't even address issues like this. And it's also significant that the report doesn't address the, the other sorts of reforms that gig workers and their allies were calling for. For instance, uh, uh, the enshrinement of the ABC test uh, to resolve issues of misclassification so that gig workers would be uh, given their full and equal protection and status. The report doesn't engage with those sorts of proposals or even acknowledge them. Um, and so uh, it's not just these, these very wrong-headed recommendations that are of concern. It's also just the, the complete lack of engagement with, with uh, gig workers' demands. Yeah. Uh, Josh, I saw in the chat somebody asked if we could briefly define what gig workers are. Can I throw that to you? Will you do that for us? Yeah, sure. I mean, listen, you know, uh, um, I think that the term could be much broader. I mean, you know, con construction industry workers are sort of the classic gig workers. But I think in this context, when we talk about you know, so-called gig workers or so-called platform-based workers. We're really talking mostly, I think, about workers who who uh, who work through platforms or for platforms, rather. Uh, you know, working for companies like uh, like Uber or Lyft, um, who use these apps uh, uh, to have their employees work on there. But um, but but yeah, I mean, the the gig economy, the old school gig economy, um, has been around forever. But I think uh, the focus for this committee certainly was really about what they call the so-called platform-based gig economy. Thank you. You know, I I often talk about when when we're being faced with something or presented with something, it's really important to sort of like pull back the veil in front of it to really look behind it. Um, and so, Josh, I'd love to to ask you. Um, what do you think we can expect from employers in Ontario if the OREC recommendations are brought forward, brought forward in February as legislation? How do you think that will bleed into other sectors? That's a, that's a great question. So uh, these recommendations, if they are enshrined in law, would undermine decent work for all working people. 
Yeah, and the devil is going to be in the details with this, but it seems pretty clear that this proposal would uh, would not give platform-based gig workers, as they describe it, full and equal status. Instead, it would give them lesser rights. It would it would lock them into a to a lesser status. And assuming that to be the case, uh, the enshrinement of this proposal, what it's going to do is create a financial and a legal incentive for employers to reclassify workers as so-called platform-based gig workers, because it's going to uh, get them around some basic workplace protections. And that is, is such an important point for people to understand, is that right now, you know, when people think about gig workers or they think about uh, these apps, they think about primarily food, food couriers and rideshare drivers. But even right now, that's not really the full extent of the gig economy. You know, the app-based gigs right now in this province have expanded into restaurant kitchens, into cleaning services, into construction, into temp help agencies. They're in long-term care in the healthcare sector. The gig economy is by no means contained to, you know, Uber and Lyft, and it's coming for all of our jobs. And so if this sort of legislation gets enshrined where app-based gig workers are given lesser status and less rights, this is just going to hasten the shift uh, from, um, from employees uh, to so-called uh, gig workers. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, and that's the theme of this panel tonight. You know, gig workers deserve proper um, rights and protections at work, like absolutely. At the same time, when legislation is being brought forward under this, this guise of protecting or supporting or making things better for gig workers, we have to take a look at that and, and see that the gig workers are being used in this moment. We're being used and the reality is that we are like a canary in the coal mine to the rest of the labor movement. What is happening right now to us is going to happen to everybody else. Um, which is also why I'm so excited there are so many people here. <laughs> um, thank you, Josh. Uh, Vina uh, Dubal is also here with us. She's a professor of law at the University of California, Hastings, um, and she helped gig workers and advocates campaign against Prop 22 in California. Vina, it's so lovely to be here with you. Thank you so much for having me. It is amazing to see such a robust um, group of people fighting against the spread of this Prop 22 like law and um, and and to see um, you having these conversations, which we frankly didn't have in California during the right time. Yeah, I remember um, when Uber and other apps were lobbying for California, it was something like two hundred million dollars they spent on that. Can you tell us a little bit about what Prop 22 was and why why these companies would spend so much money on it? Yeah. So in California, um, our California legislature, in response to a Supreme Court decision, passed a law that included what Josh, um, what Joshua spoke about, the ABC test, um, and made very clear that these companies were employee employers of their workers, Uber, Lyft, Instacart, DoorDash. And in response, because they lost at the legislature, they turned to the initiative system. Um, we have a system of direct democracy in California where if you have enough money, you can put a law on the books um, by lying to the voting public about what that law says. And that's precisely what they use their $225 million to do. Um, they spent uh, months during what was what what at the time was a global pandemic, as well as the Black Lives Matters uprisings in in uh, in California, but all over the U.S. During this time when workers of color were particularly vulnerable in various ways, um, they lied to the voting public in California and said that this was going to be a really good thing for gig workers. Um, they really insidiously used the images of workers of color in their advertising, um, on YouTube, on TV, in mailers, like everywhere you looked to say that, that, that Prop 22 was gonna give new benefits to workers um, instead of doing what it actually did, which was take away benefits for workers. Part, another reason that I think they were able to win in California was because it was so goddamn confusing Confusing. The law itself was so confusing. Um, and so they were able to manipulate how people understood it. What is really critical for everyone to understand is that what Prop 22 did was make it that so that workers are not guaranteed 
any wages or any rights. So they created this fictional new category that only applies to platform, um, uh, platform workers in which you are only paid for engaged time. That is work a pay, time after you are allocated a job um, and uh, as you finish it. During that engaged time, you are guaranteed a wage. The problem is that you are not ever guaranteed any work, right? So um, all of the quote unquote benefits, the subpar benefits that workers get under Prop 22, like a healthcare stipend, no one is able to get the healthcare stipend because as you start to get enough engaged time, the companies stop giving you work. So unlike, say, another, um, a real independent contractor who can maybe predict that their cust that they're going to have or have some control over how many customers they have, how many people they contract with, on a day-to-day -day basis, workers in California don't know now whether they're going to get any jobs. Um, and so what they essentially created was a two-tiered system, as Joshua um, articulated, in which you have employees who get the minimum wage overtime, workers' comp, sick pay, unemployment insurance, and you have these gig workers who don't get access to any of those things. And not coincidentally, these gig workers are something like 80 to 90% people of color. So you have what is the entrenching of systemic racism, um, a workforce that has no predictable income, um, no predictable protections, no safety net. Um, and those are people who, as you articulated, Jennifer, at the, at the top of this talk, are doing critical, quote unquote, essential work. So they are deemed essential by the state and simultaneously are deprived all of the protections and guarantees that other workers have. My experience as a gig worker you know we're constantly told that we are not real workers and we don't deserve anything and you know like we're basically just we don't count um yeah. and then as soon as the pandemic hit we were essential yeah which in reality meant that we were expendable yeah um, i want to ask you the same question that i asked josh or a similar version of it um, how did you see, like when Prop 22 passed, how did you see that lead out into other sectors outside traditional gig work? Yeah, I think that as this um, law was being um, debated, what I said at every single conversation I had was that this is the most dangerous labor law I have seen in my lifetime. And that you might think that this is just about Uber drivers and food delivery workers, but actually this is about all labor. And I think that fundamentally many people believe that that was an exaggerated concern, that this would really stop at food delivery workers and, um, and, and, and Uber drivers. What happened immediately after Prop 22 passed was in fact that grocery store workers who were employees um, lost their jobs, they were terminated, and the, co and the companies, um, the grocery store conglomerate ended up um, contracting with DoorDash. So immediately, immediately, like the next week, you saw workers who had uh, full, full, enjoyed full rights and protections um, doing, you know, dangerous, dangerous work, exposed them to, to, um, to illness, all of a sudden, overnight, their jobs disappeared. More recently, in just the past two days, a brand new initiative has been introduced to the California Attorney General's office to consider that would do the same exact thing that um, Prop 22 did for delivery network workers and, and um, transportation network workers, that is Uber drivers and DoorDash Instacart workers. Um, and, they, and this initiative is for the healthcare industry. So it basically, it literally says, if you are a healthcare worker, broadly defined, nurse, nurse practitioner, uh, massage therapist, um, you know, uh, occupational health therapist, whatever, and you work for a quote unquote platform, also broadly defined, it doesn't even define it in terms of a digital, um, a digital platform, it says organization, then you can be an independent contractor and don't get employee benefits. So in a pandemic, where um, the healthcare, you know, unlike in, in Canada or maybe similar to in Canada, I'm not sure, in the US healthcare is in shambles. We don't have nurses, we are, we are in dire straits in the middle of this pandemic. In this context, venture capitalists are already investing money to change the laws so that they can legalize gig work in healthcare. 
the day after Prop 22 passed, maybe it was the week after, a prominent venture capitalist, Sean Carroll, an early investor in Uber at Menlo Park Ventures, wrote an op-ed in the information. And that op-ed said, what Prop 22 makes possible. It is now possible to gigify healthcare, to gigify education, to gigify the restaurant industry, to gigify retail. They are telling us what they are going to do. And if we do not listen to them, it will happen. And I think that that is very, very important to consider um, while you are debating these issues in Ontario to know that this is not just about the immigrant workers who are delivering your warm food in the context of a pandemic. This is about everyone. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. I couldn't say it better. Um, can I ask you one more question? What lessons from California do you think uh, maybe you could offer to labor activists here in Ontario to, to defeat this threat? So I think um, a couple of things, sorry, they don't have very many arguments because this is, this is a, a terrible, exploitative, immoral way to run a business. Um, so they, they have very basic arguments. They say, oh, workers want this kind of work. Well, as you've seen in the chat, People who say that they want this kind of work are highly influenced by how the companies explain to them what it might be to be an employee. You don't have to lose your flexibility as an employee. That is a business decision. That is not a legal decision, right? So it's important to counter that those type of lies. They love to talk about how, oh, these are all part-time workers. We know from their own data that at least in the U.S., the vast majority of people who do the work, um, the vast majority of work that is done for these platforms is done by full-time workers. This is professional work. This is not casual work, despite how they want to treat it. Um, they also say that, oh, well, um, we'll have to, to lay off you know, hundreds of thousands of people if we move to an employee model. Again, also not true. Their own numbers tell us that something like between 60 and 90% of people quit doing this within six months because it's so exploitative. An employment model would actually solidify a professional and stable workforce. Um, they say that workers need and want the, the flexibility and independence. Again, these are business decisions, these have nothing to do with the allocation of employment rights. What is most important, um, I think, both in the, in the Ontario context, as well as in Massachusetts and Illinois and um, in Europe and all these different places where they're trying to replicate Prop 22, um, for me at least, the most important thing to really center here is racial justice. What they are trying to systemically do is entrench racial injustice, to make it so that people who are at the very margins of the economy, the type of people who, because of their transnational immigrant lives, because of their limited English speaking or in limited French speaking abilities, because of their, um, because of, uh, of how vulnerable and marginalized they are, are pushed into this type of work, that those people don't deserve employment protections. Those are the precise people for whom employment protections were written. Those are the people who need employment protections. These are the people that need and can benefit from unions. So to say that this is somehow in response to innovation and technology and the future of work is not only disingenuous, it is racist. And I think that that, that point really needs to be centered. I'm so glad that you brought that up, Dina. Um, so like I said, I work in Toronto. The vast majority of people who are gig workers in Toronto are migrant workers and international students. Um, and, and we see this consistently, like city to city to city, the vast majority of people who do this work are people of color and migrant workers. To create a third category that locks us out of full and equal workers' rights absolutely is based in race, racism. And we know as, you know, in Canada, as in the US, the people who have historically been locked out of workers' rights, agricultural workers or farm workers, are also people of color. So this is, again, not something new. This is not about innovation. This is not about technology. This is about the replication of racialized exploitation. Um, it is something that we have been, um, as, as the labor movement, fighting for, uh, for many, many decades. And in so many ways, Prop 22 and its progeny all over the world are, um, are regressive and racist. And I just think that it is so important to center that. I agree with you very much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Sarom Rowe. Sarom is an organizer for Migrant Workers Alliance for Change and Migrant Students United. Sarom, thank you so much for being here. Um, 
Can I ask you, could you describe the conditions for migrant workers and how the Migrant Workers Alliance is supporting workers to organize within the gig economy? For sure. And I think, you know, uh, Vina laid this out so clearly, and I am hoping that um, uh, what I'll share today will really uh, make that feel, um, you know, kind of give concrete examples of what that looks like in Canada and in Ontario. Um, as you said, I'm an um, organizer at the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, and we're a worker workers' rights organization that, uh, with a membership of migrants in farm work and agricultural work, care work, domestic work, and low-wage work, and that includes current and former international students, refugees, and undocumented people. And we also serve as the secretariat of um, the largest cross-country migrant-led um, coalition called the Migrant Rights Network. And so, you know, um, I share the same excitement with you, Jennifer. This panel is so, it's, it's so exciting because we are, you know, continuing what is a international fight, right? From California to New York, to Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, um, to Hyderabad and Bangalore in India, to multiple cities across, you know, Brazil, Turkey, South Korea, gig workers are, you know, rising up. Um, across the world. And um, what is super clear is this, there is no gig work without racialized workers, and there is no gig work without migrant workers. In Canada, um, if you, um, you know, have ever gotten a package delivered to your house, you need to thank a migrant worker. If you've eaten today, thank a migrant worker. Um, the pandemic has shown us that the people who are uh, most, uh, who ensure that we are fed and taken care of are migrant and undocumented people. And it's also shown us that migrants are essential yet excluded, um, essential and exploited. Um, and migrant gig workers uh, like, um, you know, refugees and uh, current and former international students who are our friends and co-workers, um, you know, are doubly punished, not only by bad labor laws that um, only serve the interests of the super rich and uh, corporations like Uber, um, but also by unfair immigration rules that deny people access to basic rights and protections like the ability to speak up against abusive bosses, um, access to healthcare in a country that purports to have universal healthcare, um, or even the ability to be with our families, uh, especially during a pandemic. Um, you know, right now there is a, there's massive competition that's being manufactured and set up uh, to make the working class fight each other. Right. That's the uh, that's how Uber and these like, you know, corporations and the ruling class are strengthening their power by dividing and distracting us and making us fight each other. Um, this is what's clear is that this is a crisis of competition and it's a crisis of um, inequality. And I could, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the chat here and so many of us are sharing our experiences of um, work, uh, right? Um, and how much um, how difficult it has been during the pandemic. And so you know, some of these contradictions look like while some of us uh, who have, uh, there are some of us who have no choice but to go to work and expose ourselves to risk. Um, there are also some of us who are unable to find jobs but can't access any income supports or services that are needed to survive, um, especially those of us without citizenship status, right? Um, this also looks like in the form of, um, you know, while there are provincial cuts to public education and, and health uh, that have gutted our schools and healthcare systems, uh, teachers and nurses are being pit not only against each other, uh, but against students and, and patients, right? And in the same way, um, in, um, while gig workers can barely make minimum wage are excluded from basic employment rights and benefit programs, companies like Uber tell us to work harder uh, and make us compete for orders. You know, I, I really like reminding people that gig workers know how to tell when something isn't a good deal. We, we do it all shift long. Every ping that comes in your phone, every time you, uh, like a ping being an order for folks who aren't gig workers, sorry. <laughs> but every time there's an order that pops up in your phone, you have to calculate it in your head. Is this gonna work out for me financially given the labor, the time, the uh, the pay for this order. We are exceptional at telling when something is a bad deal. Um, 
so um, could I also ask you like for the bigger picture and especially for the folks who are here in this room with us who are from unions, um, why is it important that, that we see solidarity from the broader labor movement with migrant workers and also what can that look like? You know, in this uh, moment of competition, right, um, big businesses right now are telling us that there is a labor shortage, right? Labor shortage. We're hearing it everywhere, left and right in the news, and are calling for uh, more migrant workers with fewer and more limited rights in temporary and precarious positions in order to continue exploiting us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so it, it's clear, right? And as you said, gig workers, and I think like, you know, the, as uh, members of the working class, we know when we're getting a bad deal. Um, and, you know, what, what is so amazing is that we can help each other and push each other to know who the real, uh, who the people who are responsible are, right? These people are not just, you know, um, like corporations, right? They have faces, they have names, and they also have the power to make changes that would improve our lives, right? So what we need in this time is to act uh, in solidarity with each other um, and to support all workers, gig workers, migrant workers, um, to be in solidarity rather than to allow ourselves to be made to fight each other, right? Um, and we need to build the power of workers to self-organize and fight misclassification and win the wages, working conditions and pr protections that we um, all deserve, right? Um, and that looks like struggle, struggling together in solidarity to actively dismantle the systems that create this crisis of inequality and this crisis of competition, systems that create subclassifications of workers who are told that we deserve substandard rights, right? we must refuse to surrender to these systems. And just to kind of bring it back, like one of the, the systems is the immigration system. So today in Canada, there is a multi-tiered immigration system, which means that rights are given or denied on the basis of citizenship status. Um, so, you know, we all want to live in a fair society where everybody has the same rights. And the only way we've seen is that for everybody to have equal rights, is to have equal status and that's full and permanent immigration status so you know folks who are in this room if you think that everybody must have health health care that means that everybody must have equal immigration status um, if you think that everybody uh, must have the ability to be with their families that means everybody must have uh, equal status and everybody uh, must have the ability to write, uh, assert their rights at work and that again means that everybody must have uh, equal immigration status. And, you know, what is amazing is that, you know, the labor movement and, um, you know, allied organizations, over 400 of them, which includes 8 million members, have signed our petition calling for full and permanent immigration status uh, for all migrant and undocumented people. And I'll drop a link to that in the chat because uh, we recognize that this is a shared fight, right? Yes, this is a fight for all of us. I absolutely agree with you. Um, we have time right now to do a Q&A. If folks want to share some questions in the, in the Q&A function or in the chat, um, yeah, we'll go through them. I don't know, um, maybe for folks, if you, uh, you know, pull your screen across or do the more option, uh, then you can open the Q&A and you can type in any questions. Um, we're happy to talk about that. I feel like we've talked about so much today. Okay, um, we have one question. What can we do about all of this? Um, absolutely. What do we do? This is a call to action. We are here, we are talking about this being a very big issue that impacts all workers in Ontario. Um, is there anyone on the panel who would like to answer that question? Josh, is that you? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. I mean, the first thing is that we need to fight back 
uh, and ensure that uh, that no proposal like this uh, is passed into law. Um, I think that folks are going to speak about some of the actions that we can do to get that uh, to make that happen afterwards. But I mean, I, I think uh, what I want to sort of impress on everybody here uh, is that you have the power to do that and you actually can make that change. The fact that the government uh, is going went through this whole consultation process and is trying to give this the veneer of being on the side of workers, I think really speaks to the power uh, of gig workers and their allies. Uh, the, the status quo uh, won't hold with respect to gig workers. I think everybody recognizes that change needs to happen uh, and the gig companies are fighting to try and make it this bad type of change, but we need to work to make sure that it's good, positive change. The solutions are out there. We know what needs to be done. Uh, you know, Speaking in terms of the types of laws we need to see, uh, the Preventing Worker Misclassification Act, which was a private member's bill, which was passed in the session. We need something like that passed to fight against worker misclassification uh, for all working people. Uh, and, uh, and we need to organize. Yes, we need to organize. We, I mean, everybody in this room, I'm sure we all know, like we elect, we elect politicians and sure there's a difference when we elect different parties, but the real work, the real change comes from organizing. It comes from people on the ground organizing together. Um, I saw somebody in the chat ask about like gig workers and unions. And I love, I love talking about that. So really quickly, because it relates to organizing. Um, you know, in Ontario, I think it's so interesting. We see so much movement with gig workers. Uh, there's the Food Stars United campaign, which Sarom and I were part of. Um, where Foodora workers, Foodora is an app-based food delivery company, uh, fought to unionize. Uh, we won the right to unionize, you know, no big deal. Just like 90% of the workers voting yes for the union, like, you know, it's nothing, right? Um, of course, during the pandemic, Foodora was one of the companies that struggled to make money in the pandemic and like figure out a safe way to operate. So they declared bankruptcy, left the country. Um, and, and that's actually how Gig Workers United was formed. So Gig Workers United, still part of CUPW, the union that um, we won that certification through. Uh, we also see there is the, um, the Uber Black workers who do like the airport limousine style Uber rideshare. Uh, they're currently in like, working to unionize like with their case at court um, and they're with UFCW um, and then of course it's not unionized but I still feel like it's something we should talk about there are the gig workers who are part of the class action which was certified in 2021 here in Ontario um, and for anyone in the room who works Uber I mean if that class action is successful we all stand to make a little bit of money off that right um, okay so many questions now I love it. Um, so Rome, do you mind talking about how the attempt to create a third category of employee for gig workers in Ontario, um, how, that, how that creates pressure on labor standards? For sure. I mean, this is these carve outs are e exactly, uh, you know, what we're we, all the panelists here have been saying, right, is that it's coming for all of us, right? It's whether you're today a gig worker or a migrant worker or not, right? Those of us who are working, um, it's called it's coming for all of us, right? And so to create this third category of worker means to accept and surrender to these um, to the super rich and these corporations who are telling us that you deserve less than others right um, you know I'll give an example of um, uh, one of our a story of one of our members Jatinder who is a, a migrant student gig worker um, I met him last year at the uh, Brampton Gateway Terminal um, he was on his way to work to travel to downtown Toronto to do uh, evening shifts um, and he was traveling with his bike um, and you know as an international student as someone raised this in the chat right he, he pays three times more in tuition and tuition and this is tuition that has large gone up over the pandemic and he's struggling to pay school fees and basic living expenses and he was working through the pandemic and you know um, as you've all heard today uh, being misclassified means that uber is not responsible for even the most basic health and safety protections and the most basic labor rights so you know he wasn't able to access bathrooms 
wash his hands. Um, and, and, you know, he was living paycheck to paycheck, which meant that he couldn't take time off of work when he started to get sick. And as a migrant, he wasn't able to access any income supports due to his immigration status. And so, and, you know, he's still working to this day. And even though he's doing the essential work of delivering food through cold and snow, none of this work will count toward his permanent residency application, not only because he and his coworkers, you know, are misclassified by bad provincial legislation that's bowing to the pressure of uh, companies like Uber, um, but also because the federal government in Canada deems his work low skilled and thus unworthy of being valued, right? This is not fair. We all know it. And the Gig Worker Bill of Rights is calling for equal rights for all uh, workers, for all gig workers. And part of that means calling for all work to be valued toward full immigration status. And I bring this up to show like, you know, there have historically been, and, and Rina raised this in her um, uh, talk, right? Historically been um, these third category, subcategories of workers, right? But, you know, during the pandemic, we've seen who is, essential to keeping our sustaining our world and our communities and that's uh, uh and you know and that without full rights and protections this is a life and death situation far too many migrant workers during the pandemic have died we don't even know if they got to say goodbye to their loved ones if they've had support um you know in their last days this is a life and death issue um and that's why we have to fight um against these bad uh you know um rules um, and know that this is creeping into all sectors of the economy. Yes. One of the other questions that I have here is what are some of the benefits of gig workers organizing? Uh, I love this question. I, I would like to answer this question as a gig worker. You know, I have some thoughts. Um, us organizing together means that we have something that's ours that we built and we make the decisions. So, you know, like at Gig Workers United, we, we have general meetings and everybody can come to the general meeting. And in those general meetings, that's where we make decisions. And we do that through a vote, a democratic vote. And um, we have bylaws. Bylaws are, are the rules that determine how a union runs. And, you know, they can be things like, what are dues? We don't have dues right now. so. It doesn't apply, but you know, one day bylaws are things that would decide like what are dues or how do we negotiate with our boss or how do we run our union? Those are written by us. What we want from the future, what we want from our union, what we want from our employers, we choose that. And the thing about the union is that the union gives us a collective voice to not only express what we need, but to win it. You know, like before I was a gig worker, I worked in a factory. And um, I was, you know, really frustrated. A lot of us were because we, we hadn't gotten raises and we'd been told we'd get raises by like a certain time. Um, and so I go in to talk to the VP and I'm like, hey, I really want that raise. I kind of need it. Like I work really hard. Um, I want that money. And he's like, yeah, I don't, I'm busy. I don't want to talk to you right now. And he just like kind of laughs me out of the office. Like my face was red. It was so hot. There was nothing I could do about it. Um, and a couple of weeks later, 15 of us went to his office and said, hey, we'd like our raises. Do you know whose face was red then? His face was red, not mine. <laughs> we were laughing when we walked out of his office and nearly everybody got one. Um, that's what our union gives us. Us organizing, like right now we're in this place where, where we don't really have very much at work. And with this legislation, we have to have conversations where we have to say, you know, something is not better than nothing. And that, that fucking sucks. Like it shouldn't be that way. We should always be able to have the standard, you know? Our union allows us to get that. It gives us power to win that. That power comes from us. Anyway, that was a very long answer, but it's all true. Um, <laughs> One of the other questions, and again, this one resonates really hard for me. Um, Josh, maybe you'd like to talk about this. If we were to go back to, you know, so it, if the Ford government passes legislation that brings in a third category, where are we gonna see that outside of gig work? 
what bad bosses are going to jump on this? What does it look like when a bad boss jumps on this? Yeah, well, we're already seeing the spillover e even before this sort of uh, potential legal incentive. We're already seeing, uh, you know, so-called uh, gig work or platform-based work creeping uh, into healthcare. I mean, Bina talked about what's happening in California right now with this proposal. Uh, I shared a, a link into the chat about a company that uh, that saw the pandemic as an opportunity to shift into into healthcare uh, here in Ontario. Uh, with workers that it doesn't treat as employees uh, through its uh, gig app. So I think we're going to see this all over the economy. Um, we're, you know, if, if uh, employers can, can save money uh, by paying workers less and exploiting them uh, by doing this, we're going to see it in all sorts of sectors. Uh, you know, it's coming for all of our jobs in all of our industries. I have one more question and Sarom or Josh or Patty, whoever would like to answer. Um, you know, we all know misclassification, uh, that's not new. And it's been an issue for a really long time now, particularly misclassification for media workers. So if we were to take something like the Gig Workers Bill of Rights, um, you know, which was written by gig workers, outlines gig workers' demands for what full workers' rights looks like, um, how could that be applied for workers like media workers or other um, misclassified workers um, to help ensure that they get the things that they need and build solidarity between misclassified workers. So if I can, Jennifer, if I can just pop in here, I think this is what we're fighting for. We're fighting that for all workers to be identified as, as a worker is a worker is a worker. We don't need classifications. We should not have classifications. And every worker should have the right to access benefits, to, to have a, a decent wage, uh, to have the protections that they need within their, their workplace. And, you know, I just want to say, you know, if people think it's not in Ontario yet, it already is. I live in a community, a rural community that's north of Toronto. And for the past four or five years, our municipality has used Uber as its public transportation. Um, it's so unfortunate. We keep trying to fight it, and but um, that is, you know, that is what's used, and you know that's so unfortunate. Now municipalities are are using, you know, uh, platforms like Uber to save money on their end and exploit the workers, the the Uber drivers, and really in my opinion, being in a rural area, putting some of the residents in, in very um, scary and precarious situations. So, you know, we just need to fight for every single worker and we need to fight hard. That's why labor um, is here supporting gig workers, is supporting the gig workers' rights. And, you know, we will continue to, to support and amplify their voices for all workers in Ontario. Yes. I know we have a lot of questions and I apologize, this is gonna be the last one. Um, I don't know, Josh, maybe you wanna answer this one. Uh, what's the timeline? Why, why is now the time to take action? When is uh, McNaughton Ford, when are they planning to bring in this legislation? The timeline is urgent uh, and the time for action is now. Uh, we have uh, seen signals from the government that they want this passed before for the election. Um, but even in the off chance that, you know, somehow COVID uh, and, and the recent waves delays that, this is this is going to be something that they're going to campaign on. Uh, but I think it's much more likely that we're going to see something soon. Uh, they want uh, to try and pass uh, some, what they can before the election. So the timeline for organizing and for action uh, and for pushing them and fighting back is now. And I mean, look, we may not all be gig workers, but everybody is good at telling when something is a bad deal and when like shady things are happening. Why, why does it need to be passed, you know, brought through quietly passed right now um, instead of being an election issue? Because if something is going to impact workers' rights for everybody who works in the entire province in every sector, shouldn't that be an election issue? Shouldn't that be something that everybody knows about? Um, what I think. <laughs> so I thank you so much to our panelists. All right, so I love focusing on tasks and work 
and working together and getting things done. So what if we jump to what are our next steps? What can we do together after tonight? Because of course, everything doesn't stop today. There are a lot of ways that we can all participate. If you are not a gig worker, you can support gig workers by participating in order in days, which I'll describe in a bit more detail later. Um, if you are a gig worker, then you can support by talking to gig workers in your community um, and also by talking to unions, talking to Gig Workers United, talking to Uber Black UFCW workers, um, getting to know your coworkers and talking about what you want to organize for. Uh, you can show solidarity by passing a resolution within your local, uh, you know, like your union local or your local labor council. Um, and if you'd like a sample resolution, we can share one with you. Um, you can help educate and inform others. Write letters to the editor of your local paper. Is your local paper talking about gig work? Is your local paper talking about a third category carve out? And if the answer is no, then why not? And you can take action. The most meaningful way that we can take action moving forward is by pressuring our MPPs. MPPs need to understand that they have the ability to help make sure that workers' voices are heard. So you can host uh, Gig Workers United phone zap in your community that can be um, with your family and your friends, with folks from your union local, from your workplace, from your labor council. I don't care, you can host one. Um, you can reach out to folks at Gig Workers United, to folks at OFL if you wanna connect with us. And, um, we can have some gig workers come to your meeting and host a phone zap and talk about why this is all so, so, so important and even pass to that what the next steps are. But the work doesn't stop today, it starts today. And all of the things that we do moving forward, we do together and united together because we are all in the same fight here. So we talked about order in days. So order in days are a way they're a way for you to show support for gig workers in like multiple ways. So here, maybe I'll tell you a story instead. So when I joined the Foodsters United union campaign, order in days had already been created and were running. I didn't know what it was. I found out later, um, but I was working. I was still running mostly on Uber at the time and it's hard. It was summertime, it was hot. I don't like the heat, I was sweaty, very unhappy. Uh, there was a lot of traffic. I was not having a good time. I'd been working for like six hours. Like it was a bad shift. I, I was not happy about my life decisions in that moment. And I go to deliver to this person and she steps outside and she talks to me for a little bit. The first thing she said to me was, how are you? And I don't think anyone had asked me that for like days. And it was really hot. My face was so red. Um, I was sweaty. She offered to get me water for my water bottle and some ice, which, yes, yes, I needed that. <laughs> um, but she just talked to me for a little bit. She talked about my work. She asked questions about my work. She asked me if I knew about the union. But it was mostly that in this moment, somebody else was talking to me and acknowledging me as a person who does valuable work. And that, that's so counter to what this job can feel like most of the time. Like I often tell people if I, if I wanna go out in public and like, you know, not have any like creepy guys stare at me or say anything rude to me, I just put on my courier bag and my courier coat. Cause when I wear that, it's, it's like, I don't exist. Nobody sees me. Um, order in days are a way to remind gig workers that you as another working class person recognize that their work is valuable. And then they are also a way for you to help gig workers engage with their union, with Gig Workers United. Maybe they know about it, maybe they don't. Sometimes it's hard to reach out to folks when you don't know them. And so having a positive conversation about the union with somebody who seems to recognize that you are human can make it feel easier to reach out to the union and to talk to strangers. Um, so when you're doing that, you're both like ideally helping us have a slightly better day, if you're able to, um, ensuring that maybe our pay for that hour is better by tipping and helping to provide engagement, engagement for 
our union and for us connecting with each other. That is a deeply meaningful way to show solidarity. Um, this document that's, that's on the screen here is a document that you can get. There's a link, I think it's been shared already so that you can download this. You can shoot us an email and we'll send it to you. Um, but it, it walks you through how to engage in order in days, how to participate. And, you know, it's fairly simple, pretty easy. Um, I know a lot of us are ordering food now with the restaurants not being open with the pandemic. So I imagine you'll have a lot of opportunities to give it a try. Yes, James just shared the link in the chat. Amazing. Okay. I feel like I've talked a lot, so just a little bit longer, I promise. Um, I want to talk to you about what I have learned in organizing and what, what we try and teach each other within Gig Workers United. What I've learned from the broader labor movement is this idea, and it, I mean, it comes from like a phrase that everybody seems to use, but this idea that our work is about raising the floor or building a floor, like a floor that we all stand on. It's about creating that floor. And that floor um, has like a real definition, like it's not an imaginary thing. That floor is employment standards. Um, it's full workers' rights. And we all stand on that floor. And so like as unionists, we know that. That's what we are trying to do. A third, car a third category, a carve out, that means that that if this, is, if this is full workers' rights, something less is below. And it means no matter, you know, if those workers are unionized, if those workers unite together and organize and they fight back, you know, no matter what they do, there's that, that floor is above them and it becomes a ceiling and they can never, they can never get above it, never. It's, it's a ceiling, it, it, it keeps us in, it prevents us from standing on the same floor that everybody else stands on. So, I mean, for folks here who are part of unions, for folks where your union and the union movement is important to you, this is what it's about. It is about all of us standing on that floor together. And, you know, I would offer like coming out of the pandemic, seeing how so many of us were left behind, how, you know, when we were left behind by our government, if our government brings in these carve outs, when we see this legislation, that is confirmation that our government is looking at what is a floor, like what we view as a floor that all of us stand on and all of us are equal from. They are viewing that. They are trying to turn that into a quicksand pit and we all get pulled super deep in it and it will be impossible or extremely difficult for us to dig ourselves out. It is much easier to fight now and to prevent ourselves from falling into the quicksand than it is to try and dig ourselves out later. That is what we are up against. And if we do that united together, if we fight together, we will win. Because that's literally what the whole labor movement is about. Workers stand together, they know what they need, they figure out how to get it, and then they fucking get it. That's, that's what it's about. We can do that now, we can do that together. So I'll hand it off to Patty to um, send us home for the night. Sorry, you think I would be faster at getting to that uh, uh, turn on the mic. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this has been uh, such an incredible uh, conversation tonight and a very important conversation. And, and it's something that, you know, we all, we all needed to hear, and I hope that it inspires you to join the fight because the fight does not end here. We will continue to amplify gig workers' voices and stand in solidarity with gig workers and all workers. We will demand better for every worker in Ontario. And I want you to mark your calendars because there's some really exciting um, uh, uh, activities and actions and events that are taking place at the OFL. But I want you to mark your calendars for our activist assembly that's coming up on Sunday, March 6, uh, where we're going to come together to, um, to come together to learn, to keep learning and building to demand better for Ontario workers and ensure that we vote out this anti 
worker, government, and this year's provincial election. Then, really exciting, on May 1st, I want you to join us and thousands across the province to fight for Ontario's future. On International Workers' Day, we were going to rally to get rid of Ford's, um, to get rid of Ford and the Conservatives come election day on June 22nd, 2022. We're gonna flex our muscles to demand a workers first agenda. So I hope that you will join me. I hope you will join us. I hope that you will take the lead in this fight in your area, in your community. I know that we can do this. We can do this together um, and let's do this. Uh, solidarity. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight.